Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Today is all about leading, Mark. We've got quite a few questions that all go back to that same topic. So we're hoping you're going to give us a lot of information on how you see the benefit of leading as well as how you are tackling it. The first question is from Christine. She has a three and a half year old gelding who's doing really well following the feel in the round pen. They walk around and explore, but when it comes to going back into the paddock, he doesn't want to go. And she's finding that she's putting a lot of pressure in front of him with the flag and the rope. And she ends up holding out treats and then he follows her. Do you have any tips with that one, please? Um, most, most probably, I think, um, you would um, be wanting to uh, step up what you're doing when he's in, you know, the round pen or whatever, you know, where, you, where you're training him. Um, you sh- when the horse starts to learn how to lead, you know, the flag should be something you need to use all the time. Um, if you're still not needing that flag to sort of, uh, you know, getting get him to sort of engage with that feel a little bit. Now, it's not about coming towards the flag. It's about getting closer to the question. So, you know, when we, when we pop a flag or something like that, I don't want the horse to come to the flag. I just want to, uh, it to create enough awareness that they become more aware of the feel. So the flag is more so, I guess, there to let go of, you know, the other horses or whatever the horse is thinking about. Um, but it's not to draw it into the flag. So, um, and, and if you've been working and he's working and following a field and you think he's going pretty good, then um, we, we don't really need the flag anymore. You might just want to sort of stick to the field and, yeah, maybe add more pressure if you need to. But I would say uh, step it up in the round yard, get him to sort of lead a bit stronger, you know, back up here, lead up here. Um, cause so he might have a certain rhythm in the way you're asking him, <coughs> excuse me, to lead. And you've got to say, well, lead a bit, bit more and, you know, trot up a little bit, slow down, um, and put more emphasis on, um, him being a bit more responsible and to sort of respond a bit more, um, briskly when you ask, uh, so that would stimulate, uh, or simulate sort of, you know, when he's under pressure and he pulls back a little that he knows the answers to come forward and move a bit quicker. Okay. And that's just going to get him a bit, um, you know, uh, yeah, more alert and, and have more responsibility at following that feel. So, so yeah, more in the environment where he's more neutral and he doesn't have a really strong thought, uh, and, and see if you can find any braces in there. And I reckon when you step it up a little bit, you'll find a few braces. The other thing, instead of, you know, maybe using the flag, throw it away. And when he does get stuck, just keep walking off to the side and walk a circle around him so you can just get him like keep keep the pressure on walk around him till he off balances um and he has to move his feet and then after a while he knows that he can't just stand there rigid um and he's just got to learn to move you know no shift when you start to pick up on that feel and then you'll start to free up the thoughts again and start to follow the feel um but yeah just just try a few of those things and see if that can sort of help him out Okay, the next question is from Michelle. She has a yearling. So his leading was going lovely, but over the past four to, four to three to four weeks, when she goes to lead him, he walks a few meters and then his energy goes up and he starts to head toss and then sometimes he can rear up, getting really excited. So she doesn't want him scared of her, but she doesn't want him thinking that that behavior is acceptable and she's not sure what approach she should take. Um. He won't get too scared of you. He'll only be more scared of the trap or something. So something's probably happened in there that's, uh, you know, that he's still not quite, well, he still doesn't quite understand the feel. Um, he might have been going pretty good, pretty steady. He might have had one bit of a panic one day, hit the feel a few times harder than he's used to or hit the boundary harder than he's used to and then suddenly lost a bit of trust in it. And then when he's got a strong thought to sort of be back with other horses and stuff, that, that feel might be presenting a bit of a trap to him. So he's going, oh, right, right I'm, I'm a bit worried now. So really, um, I think, and, and it's much the same as the, the question I just answered, is um, a lot of times we go steady with our horses and then when they accidentally have a little mini meltdown, they, they hit the rope a few times a bit harder than they used to and then suddenly they get a fright. And we're trying to build them up in training for that. So, so I think what I would start to do is um, start to step it up a bit, you know, walk up a little quicker, you know, 
uh, put a back up on him and, and, and start to put him under just a little more pressure with that feel. And you might provoke a bit of a head fight and, and things like that. But if you're standing back at a distance um, and you're not, your energy is not coming towards him and you're not sort of crowding him uh, with, with, you know, at all, then he's just going to sort of bounce off the boundary a little bit and then find centre. So as soon as he sort of starts to search in, in the right direction, obviously you loosen on that rope. Um, but if he has a little panic, if you're standing in the right spot, you might give him a bit of freedom, take up the rope a bit, show him a boundary, loosen up, and let him kind of bounce around in it a little bit until he kind of, you know, stops uh, stops that little panic and then you kind of loosen up and let him, let him find centre. And, um, and then, you know, more in a safe environment where he doesn't have a lot of um, other things to sort of hook onto or think about, that's where you're going to step it up and get him moving a little bit more active uh, with that feel. And... Um, even bring in, you know, little little mini sort of, you know, worrying things like when you pop the flag a little bit and he worries and he searches and, and, and finds that pressure until he knows that the boundaries are clear and, uh, and and the pathway is clear. So he knows how to follow that feel and, and he becomes not so frightened of those boundaries. And and that, that, that'll just get him a lot more used to the feel. Uh, so when he does get a strong thought, he doesn't just sort of panic because he doesn't quite understand it. So it's um it's yes it's raising that threshold a little bit. That's really all you're doing. Because foals can just go up on their hind legs quite easily, don't they? They do. Yeah, they, they seem to do that quite Sometimes easily. they can sort of really, you know, the first time they've hit a rope a little hard or something, they can just kind of reef and pull and and um and sometimes you've just got to like it, like if you're finding it really difficult, you know, with with foals and stuff, I've always got a yard that's uh you know my rope's long enough that the yard can catch them, so I'm not sort of worried about them getting away because I just kind of let them turn around pick the rope up so they don't get tangled up and let the yard catch him. So if you find that he's starting to panic a little too much, then you, you put him in a smaller yard. And, and, and if he does get up and look, it looks a bit dangerous, without throwing the rope to the ground, you just let him have space so the yard catches him or the fence catches him. And then when he's come back around again, you offer him that pathway again until you can actually catch him with a bit more feel when he's a bit worried and not need the yard. But... Um, yeah, if, if it gets like that, you, you, you're obviously in a safe place. So, um, but I think, yeah, by, by raising the bar a little bit and um, being a bit more, you know, getting a bit more responsive with the field, then um, then they're, they're ready for it in, in case it, you know, when it speeds up or they've accidentally speeded it up when, by, by, by hitting it a bit fast. Next question is from Nicole, and this is to do with float loading, but it's all to do with leading, of course. So she's purchased a new horse and he's quiet and a really nice natured gelding. Uh, he's 11 years old. But one of the things you can't do is go on the float. Now she's seen you do this at Connect. She's watched all of the float loading videos that you've got. But what she's finding is that she can get him three quarters of the way. He won't stand. And then he puts his head sideways and he reefs the lead from her hand and storms backwards. So she's just wondering how she gets around this this kind of a block that she's got with him. Um, that's right. The other horses, um, leading is the key to good floating, but some horses have had a really bad experience and some horses are claustrophobic, those sorts of things. So there's a certain amount of uh, willing exposure the horse needs to a confined space like that to become comfortable about being in there. But, there's, um, but you can't expose a horse to a float without education. So... Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, there's, there's plenty of ways of getting a horse close to a float and to walk on a float. But without anything goes wrong without education, it can, go, it, can, it can be a bigger thing that goes wrong. And also, you don't have the tools to teach a horse to think softly in, and walk softly into a horse float or slowly or carefully if, if you haven't educated them either. So... It, Education is the key. Float. The float is the second part of it. So, like what I was talking about with the other horses, you're going to take him away, and you're going to see how well he leads, and you're going to step it up a little bit. Um, so you, you, you'd sort of, you know, you know, a good thing for floating. Really, one of the most important things that uh, a horse needs to understand, and back, backwards could mean forwards at any time. So, so, you know, I do a lot of sort of backing lessons where I'm backing them up and they start to get a strong back up and they're very quickly without my body language showing them, I pull the rope forward and they have to try and come forward to that at the speed that I asked or at the speed that the rope asked. 
and you've got to have that established really well. You've got to be able to sort of rock a horse forwards and backwards. So their whole body just loosely rocks forwards and backwards. And when you're leading him away from the float, watch how well he kind of, if does he stretch and move? Because a lot of horses kind of stretch and move and stretch and move and then lean a bit down and then back up every time you sort of do it. And you might think they're going okay, but actually they're, they're really kind of running quite a bit late and there's still a lot of brace in them. So um, I imagine, you know, though, though I want the horse to be thinking forwards and backwards, a good little thing to do is watch their hind feet and when they're leading forward, imagine as soon as you've touched that rope and pulled on their pole a little bit that their hind feet move. Because um, a lot of horses stretch and then the front feet move and their hind feet move. If they're leading like that, well, he's going to get halfway in the float, throw his head and then back out because he's not really engaging and thinking forward with that rope and moving with it accordingly. So, so away from that float, um, you want to really be working how well does he lead. If you were standing there, uh, and you were walking and you just pushed up on that lead and he'd just come forward nice and soft past you if he, if you without needing to see your body language or anything like that. So if, if they're working really good out there and, you know, you can start to sort of put a little feel on them, move their hindquarter over, stuff like that, through that through the, um, through the halter knot, um, you know, move their shoulders over, push the halter knot over, their shoulders move over softly, things like that then you know things are going really well and they don't question the feel. So you take all the question of the feel away, away from the float. So the horse doesn't go, I'm just going to reef. You want to take all that reef out of them and that happens away from the float. And a lot of horses, if you do it thoroughly, though they might be nervous at the float, they won't reef because they know the answer and they know the boundaries are clear. So I'd say away from the float, step it up, um, Show him he's, he's, he's responsible to follow it a, li a little bit more, a little bit stronger. Um, put him in some sort of challenging situations that, that he still can find his way out of with the rope, as in, as in you're going to do it faster and, you, and, you, and, and there'll be no warning when you come forward. So he gets a little bit of a shock, but, he, but because there won't be confusion to a trained horse because they know wherever it goes, they go. Um, so they're used to being interrupted. So, so you probably do, yeah, a lot, a lot more constant little interruptions. And uh, then take him back to the horse float. And before he gets to the spot that he actually normally reefs, just work on getting him really soft at moving on, off, on, off, and then start to step it up a little bit. So you can say, step your front feet on a little quicker and back off and step up, relax, go backwards slowly and forward slowly. And, and until he, you know, he's loose and he's just moving in that space that he has already accepted. And I reckon you'll find that once you do that, you'll find actually I wasn't really asking enough and he was a little bit dull when he was going on that first part and his thoughts were still backwards. And, and you'll see a, a horse that's really engaging and thinking and then get then you'll get to that old threshold where he's through his head. And, and, um, and, and by the time he's got to there, he'll be that loose and soft in there that you can just work on forwards and backwards into that spot and preempt him a little bit in the sense that back him up and then ask him forward before instead of trying to inch them forward inch by inch by inch you preempt it and go back up forward and and then soon enough if you see a bit of a thought change in him where he starts to go oh, i might quickly put him in a backup and just say back up a little bit and that'll distract him from what he was about to do because he would have been expecting someone to pull him forward and he and and he would have and he go oh hang on a minute i'm backing up and you'll feel the pressure come from his nose that'll distract him off that really strong outward i'm going to escape thought put him back into the backup and once he's backing up and you feel he's soft in your hand, then right then you ask him for another forward step. So you'll still get him to come forward, but you've overridden the pullback by possibly giving him a little backup and then said, come forward. The backup's not punishment. I see people when their horse reefs to back their horse half half a kilometre away from the float backwards to punish them. The, back, the backup's not a punishment. It's just overriding his strong thought. Um, to interrupt him and say try this and a lot of horses I found that were about to pull back as soon as I engaged them into a backup they, Their mind was thinking get my feet out of this float But as soon as you said back up they actually slow down and they go oh, no I can't back I can't back fast off a float I've got to back slowly and they'll slow down and push against you and they'll either say oh I've got to get careful with my feet Whereas they're about to just run out, but they weren't running out. They're actually really jumping out mm. That's kind of what they're doing. They're not walking out. They're jumping out in a sense so uh, avoiding every part of it. So yeah, that's another little thing to say to do if you were just about to think he's going to reef. But uh, I'd say yeah, step the leading up a little bit away from the float, get him really supple, and then take him back 
and constantly watch those thoughts. If you see them start to creep back, distract and bring them forward. Okay, whether that be with the feel of a rope or even just bang your leg for a second. Um, and, and so it can really let go of those outward thoughts and, um, and, and you know, hook onto the flow a little bit more so he's, so he's got time to think about it and understand it. Okay, and slightly to do with um, leading, but perhaps more to do with ropes, you might correct me on this one. Sheila is asking, if you ever tie youngsters up for a period of time or at any age? Yep, um, tying ups or preparing them to tie ups is very important, you know, because someone will tie them up one day and it'll go wrong. And, you know, if you're not going to own the horse forever, you've got to think of it like, okay, you know, and, and also they're tied up in a horse float. You know, a lot of people tie their horse up in horse floats and they kind of rely on the bridge and bar doing all the work and other things like that. But I think I think you still got to work it that the that the horse really understands that lead rope. So the best saying that I've ever heard was the best way to teach a horse to tie up is don't tie it up. Um, and then someone says, well, how do you teach it to tie up by not tying it up? Well, you teach it to lead, leading, leading, leading. You know, and once a horse is... I was right. <laughs> yep, leading. It always goes back to leading. So, yeah. So when your horse is leading really well, and what I mean leading really well, it's not like, oh, my horse is following me around, look, I can tie it up. No, you can stand still and ask the horse to do things on the end of a rope and they are separate from you in the sense that they're happy to commit to that rope regardless of what you're doing. You could be sort of standing on your head as long as you can hold a rope nice when you're standing on your head the horse can follow the rope no matter what you're doing. Uh, and I find that a very important thing. Why that's so important is because how many times do we put the rope on a rail and walk away from our horses? And if our horses have been one of those horses that we've said, you know, oh, I've done a lot of liberty with my horse, I've done a lot of body language stuff, the horse reads everything I do. Well, 30 seconds or not even that, 10 seconds into you walking away, the horse is pouring the ground, you know, looking at you, wondering why, why it's over here and you're over there. So, you know, for my young horses, I, I say, you know, I'm, I'm fairly important, you know, I'm okay, like, I, you know, I'm your friend and trust me and all that sort of stuff, and, but I'm not that important. Um, the rope's more important than me. And, um, and if you treat it like that, because really the rope is more important than us um, because we leave them with the rope and nobody else is there. So, you know, horses are a herd animal and they need company in their normal environment. And then suddenly we, we put them all alone in a horse float or tie them up all alone and just hope they're going to be okay. So that's why I say the rope's more important is us because that is the missing link. That's the thing that keeps them um, better in their mind because they truly understand it. And uh, whereas if they're relying off our body language, then, then they wouldn't tie up good at all. So if you've got really good leading happening, really good leading, then you might be able to sort of throw your rope over a rail and then just walk away and pull the long rope and the horse walks up to the rail where you're walking the other direction. It's a really good thing to practice on both sides. Uh, the longer the rope, the better. You, you know, you might set your horse over here and make it feel like it's ground tied, walk 10 metres over to the rail and then walk off in the other direction somewhere and the horse has got to follow the feel of that rope all the way up to the rail. And if you want, stop at any point. The rail's not a destination. If you do it too quickly, the horse will just walk up to that rail and, but it's not that, it's about following how much rope is asking them to walk, how, how far to walk. So, uh, and you do it on both eyes and you might walk them up the rail where you're waving something a little scary or doing something a little scary and they're like, oh, what's happening? I'll follow the rope, I'll follow the rope, my rope's the best way through and I'll follow the rope up to the rail. And if they're doing that really well, then you might put a, enough wraps on the rail that you can kind of firmly pull it. It takes a bit of firmness to get it, but it'll still slip. Um, and then you know they're a bit safe. If they do start to have a panic, it'll it'll slowly slip, but it won't break like um, string, uh, bailing twine, uh, and and pop because that bailing twine pop encourages them to pull till it pops, um, and then that then makes them worse. If you hard time too early and, and and you made it you've made a bit of an error in their leading and all, or also you know there's something happens, then they'll have a big panic and a pullback and you could hurt them. So yeah, put a few wraps on the rail that it's or a tie blocker that's got it got the, the right amount of slip. They're those sort of figure of eight, like a you know, as a, a tie blocker could be as simple as a um the figure of eight abseilers, you know, that abseilers would use one of those. They're they're good, they'll work, uh, depending on how you wrap your rope through it. Um and yeah, you can tie them up with them. 
And when it comes to tying them up for some time, um, I don't tie them to the to the tree of patience for hours on end. I do it in like graded bits, just like you would take a horse out a little way and then take it back to the yards before you ride it out a little further. Um, you might tie your horse up while you while you're just mucking out the, the round yard or the yard, and just have it tied up where you're hanging around it a little bit, doing a few things, walking away, coming back, and it might only be for a few minutes, and then you might untie it you know, walk around with it where you do something else, tie it up for a few minutes and then increase that time and then the horse starts to get more confident of being tied up and as you're doing stuff and jobs, you might go into your shadow shed and come out again and, you know, the horse goes, oh, they've come back, right, oh, and then, and then at the end of a week or so, you know, you might find you're walking up down the paddock, catch a horse and come back and the horse is still tied up there fine. Um, but, but do it in increments first, don't just sort of time up for a long time and, as I say, it might be a few minutes and it might end up 10 minutes and 20 minutes at a time. Um, but, yeah, you don't just put a, put a baby on, on it and then sort of until they're starting to panic, you would sort of try and take them off before that happens while they're still calm and then, and then keep doing it. And then while you're there, put them under a bit of pressure and then one day you might, they might have a little bit of panic, but you know they've been tied up long enough that they'll figure it out themselves instead of sort of getting a complete mess. Okay, we're going to move on. There's some different questions coming through, Mark, and we're going to answer these um, as quickly as you can, okay? So I'm going to hit you with them. The first one is all about balancing in the trot. Um, this lady would like to know how to use, um, how to rebalance her horse when he's trotting. So he's falling in and she's been using the direct rein. So when he starts to fall in at the trot, does she keep using the direct rein? And obviously he's going to slow down into a small circle, maybe go into a walk, or is it better to use the indirect inside rein to move him out and rebalance and try again? Yeah, okay. So he's, I think, yeah, because when I read the question, I thought it was, he's falling in on the direct rein. Um, and, and, you know, what can you do to stop that falling in? Um, so basically, that that that's a fairly the thing I would do, and I think I think because I know your horse too, I think I do it more like this: is I would start, I, I would I would just teach 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 your horse to you know start off on a straight line. So it's going to be more. I think you said the trot that's happening. Um, you would have had it established at the walk. So you you just teach your horses that the amount of direct rein that you're asking is the amount of turn that they're offering. So some horses start to think as soon as you feel they feel they open, they just sort of fall across. But, and that's why in all your turns, you're lifting your horses so they think across and step across. So when you're coming up to your corner, you lift up your rein and, and it's going to be more of an indirect rein, not for the hind quarter though, to get the wither to push out to the outside. So you lift up that inside rein, it'll be against her neck and you lift up and then you just push and kind of aim for about, you know, an inch or so past to the outside of the outside ear when you push forward and that'll encourage her to push out a little bit, okay? So you come up, straight line, take a bend, push out a little bit. So she learns to lift up and push up and out a little bit to that inside rein. And then when she's following it out a little bit, and this is the most crucial, well, this is an important thing in this one, is some horses have been taught to just, just go over with the shoulders with a bend and just shoved over. And they're kind of still heavy on the forehand, but they're pushing out in a way that they would run out through the shoulder. Um, so that's why it's very important when you're teaching, you're lifting the rein up to lift the wither up and they push over. So you, you go straight line, push over. And when they're following the inside rein and yielding off it, but their thoughts are still on the inside rein and they haven't thought to the outside, and then you just say, now step in a little bit, okay? And you might get them just come come in a little bit or just follow the feel of that open rein as it opens up a tiny bit for them just to come onto a circle. Um, and then you might just do another little straight line and say, push out a little bit. Now follow the inside rein in just a tad. And you teach them to follow the inside rein with accuracy instead of just go left or right. Uh, and then soon when they're following it with accuracy, you can open it more and they'll open and lift more and they'll sort of step in as much as you've asked because they're starting to follow the amount of rain, not just left rain means left, right rain means right. They're following the feel of the rain, just like if I was leading you with a rope, the more I move the rope, the more you move, the less I move, the less you move. 
um, but you, you get them to hook onto the left rein, but push out with their withers. So their thoughts are to the left, but the withers pushing right. If it was the other side, their thoughts are right, but the withers pushing left. And then when they're doing that left push, then you lead them in a little bit. And that'll help her out a lot. Okay, the next question is from Kelly. She has a Brumby gelding, Denny, who, when she walks past some paddocks on at the adjustment property, all the paddock geldings come racing up to the fence as they walk past. Denny sort of turns into a fire-breathing stallion, she says, snorting neck arch, tail raised, bouncing around on a high-stepping prance. She's in no danger, but she'd just like to know, is there any way that she can help him? He's clearly stressed and threatened. Um, yeah. It is a tough one, that one, because they, they do do it. It's just a very quick change of thought if you can do it. So you basically do something big enough to make him let go of that for a moment and then take him away. Don't don't endure. Don't try and sort of change his thought and make him endure it. It's too hard because it's that raw, natural wild horse coming in. Um, you know, he feels threatened. And um, so sometimes I would, yeah, most definitely lead, lead it. Like you do want to... In, in every case, if we're going to be riding horses, it's important that we can do something to get him to let go. So I would, if he starts to do that, you know, if you've got, if you've got a flag with you, use it. If you just bang your leg. But the other thing is I'd just take on that rope and I'd, I'd, I'd walk him off in a new direction and I'd tell him to let go of it, change that thought. Um, so whatever you think is going to be the most effective at changing his thought to start with, as I say, might pop a flag. But after that, you've got to work on, well, I've got to eventually use a rein to change their thought. So I'm going to be starting to work on that. But don't say change the thought, change the thought, and just rub his nose against all the horses and have him close to them. Um, change his thought and then walk in a different direction a little bit to say, let's get out of here for a bit. Um, and the other thing sometimes you can do when horses come up like that, I, I step in first and I'll drive the horses off a little bit. Like, you know, I'll, I'll come in as a leader and um, chase them off a bit, then I'll lead him like I've, I've sort of the one that did it for him a little bit. Um, sometimes I'll do that as well uh, but a, a clear change of thought and take him off those for a little bit and then when you walk back towards them you drive them off a little bit um, and then and then change his thought walk away again and until he starts to follow your feel and not worry that it, it you know because really he, he's bound to you by that rope but he and, and the fence but they don't kind of um, some horses don't acknowledge the fence they just feel the energy the horse is coming up and they've got to do something about it so if you intervene first so that energy slows down, as in those horses turn away from you and go off and settle and go back, then 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 you've diffused some of that for him and then you won't have to change his thought as much either. So, that, you know, think of it like that. He's, he's preparing himself to be confronted. You can take some of that confrontation away by how you control those other horses. Um, but still effectively, if you change his thought, it's like the the leader that says, well, I'm going to change his thought, but let's go over here. I'll deal with the big problems right now. Uh, so he puts his thoughts into you helping him opposed to him thinking, I've got to do it all. So you're just taking the responsibility off him. Wonderful. That's some great tips. Thank you. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you for your questions, everybody. Thank you, Mark. We'll Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everybody. You can learn more from Mark online through his online training videos. Just search Mark Langley Horsemanship. There's over 380 training videos which everyone has access to with a seven-day free trial. If you like what you see, it's just $15 a month from there. That's help where you need it.